Every academic discipline has a method of inquiry and a scope or subject matter of the discipline. Economics is uh, no different in this respect. In this lecture, we'll talk about the method of economics. Let's begin with the definition. Economics, we say, is a study of human action. Human action, which is the subject matter or scope of economics, we define as purposeful behavior. It's that subset of human behavior that is directed toward the attainment of an end. A human action is motivated by the a desire to achieve a goal. <clears throat> now when we speak about the uh, a method of uh, inquiry in an academic discipline, we're speaking about the procedure for discovering scientific law. So academic disciplines can be distinguished by being either methodical, where there are scientific laws to be discovered in the academic discipline by the method, <clears throat> or non-methodical, academic disciplines for which there are no scientific laws and therefore no methodical uh, inquiry. Uh, we've already mentioned that economic theory is methodical. There are economic laws. The method of inquiry is then uh, available for the discovery of these laws. But we also mentioned uh, the second branch of economics, economic history. Historical inquiry is not methodical. <clears throat> there are no uh, laws of history to be discovered and therefore no methodical approach uh, can be useful in historical inquiry. Now, one of the uh, distinguishing features of a methodical inquiry is that it permits independent verification by personal experience with the facts. The best example of this that we're all familiar with is the natural sciences, the empirical hypothesis testing method, or the so-called scientific method of the natural sciences. In this uh, procedure, it's possible for independent scholars to conduct a, a similar test to the empirical uh, test of another scholar who has claimed uh, the validation of some a natural law. Uh, they don't have to take uh, the claim on the testimony of the uh, discoverer of the uh, natural law, but they can uh, conduct their own experiment, they can uh, create a new experiment uh, to test the law. Uh, the same is true in economics. The method, as we called it before, of praxeology, this uh, logical deductive method can also be uh, replicated by any scholar who wishes to establish for himself the veracity of a claim that's made about an economic law. <clears throat> Now let's uh, just review real quickly the natural science method of empirical experimentation or empirical hypothesis testing as an illustration of a methodical inquiry. By method, we mean the procedure that's used in this inquiry. Uh, it's usually laid out in the following order. We start with a hypothesis, uh, some claim about the uh, relationship, then gather facts, through experimentation or some natural occurring event or set of events, uh, then the hypothesis is tested to see if it uh, conforms to the facts or you know, explains them or describes them. And then a conclusion is stated. The hypothesis is either uh, rejected or not rejected. <clears throat> now let's take a, an example of the natural science method of empirical experimentation. You may remember from your history books reading about how Galileo purportedly tested an implication of the law of gravity by dropping objects with different mass off the Leaning Tower of Pisa. <clears throat> uh, the way in which he uh, formulated this uh, law to be tested 
uh, was in, uh, in this manner. First, a description in the mathematical formula of the force of gravity as a gravitational constant multiplied by the product of the mass of the two objects, m1 being the object uh, he dropped, m2 being the Earth, and the uh, uh, r being the uh, distance between the two objects squared, the so-called inverse square law. <clears throat> it's also true that force is equal to the acceleration of a body multiplied by its mass. So with simple uh, algebra, it can be shown that the acceleration of a body is independent of its mass. It depends only upon the gravitational constant, the mass of the second object, and the distance between the two. So if Galileo takes uh, iron balls of different mass uh, up to the leaning top of the leaning tower of Pisa and drops them off, uh, according to this a hypothesis, they should accelerate at exactly the same rate and hit the ground then at exactly the same time. <clears throat> so this is the way in which the test would be conducted. Uh, this would be done over and over again to uh, establish a body of facts, a body of cases that uh, bear upon the hypothesis itself. <clears throat> now next we want to think about what presuppositions must be held in order for the natural science method to make sense. <clears throat> and these presuppositions uh, include the following. The first is that the events themselves can be reproducible. Uh, that is, when the test is replicated by another scholar, somebody else takes uh, different massed objects uh, to the top of the Empire State Building drops them off or to the top of the Eiffel Tower and drops them off, <clears throat> that this is a, a sufficient replication of the, uh, of the event and of the, uh, to uh, illustrate the natural law that is bringing about the results uh, surrounding this event. Second, as we saw in our example, the effects that are being hypothesized about are quantitatively definite. A mathematical formulation can be given of the hypothesis and what's being tested is some precise quantitative aspect of this relationship. Uh, the law of gravity as a hypothesis is not the claim that objects always fall down instead of uh, going up when they're dropped, but that the force of gravity uh, on Earth, at least, is 9.8 meters per second squared, or that the acceleration of objects of different mass is exactly the same. <clears throat> A third presupposition is that the effects are invariant across time and place, so that the natural law really is a law that's functioning universally. It operates in Paris, it operates in Pisa, it operates in New York, it operates in the 16th century and the 20th century. It operates uh, on the moon. It operates anywhere uh, in the material universe. <clears throat> um, it's necessary to hold these presuppositions as true in order to think that the experiment is actually gathering knowledge for us, uh, exposing for us this natural law. Uh, these are not principles that we prove by doing the test. They're assumptions or presuppositions we must hold for the test to make sense. <clears throat> now, the implications of the natural science method, uh, one implication is that we can do scientific prediction so that we could make a prediction that uh, other objects that we would drop from the top of uh, the Leaning Tower of Pisa would also accelerate in the same fashion as the uh, different massed uh, objects that Galileo dropped. <clears throat> now let's think about uh, economics and the scientific laws of human action in contrast to those of uh, the natural sciences. First let's think about the presuppositions 
that we just mentioned about empirical hypothesis testing to see if they if we can reasonably presume that they would hold for uh, laws of human action are the events reproducible <clears throat> uh, let's take the case of uh, the law of demand so the law of demand says that only at lower prices will people buy more of a good if we consider this uh, an empirical proposition to be tested for some quantitatively definite magnitude of this effect, then it would seem that the replication of events would be problematic. Uh, this is because in every event at a different point in time, <clears throat> or taken by a different uh, person, or taken by the same person in a different place, since it's being conducted in a different set of circumstances, the person involved can make a judgment in his mind about the value of these different circumstances that is different depending upon the place, depending upon the time, or depending upon the person. So there's no reason to think that there's any replication of the, uh, of the event itself <clears throat> that if we uh, looked at uh, the amount of uh, gasoline, let's say, a person purchased um, last week uh, at a certain price and the amount of gasoline he purchases next week at a certain price, that there would be any necessary relationship between uh, <clears throat> changes in the uh, price of the good from one moment in time to the next and the quantity demanded. This is because the events themselves are not strictly uh, reproducible. Now, what about quantitative definiteness? Uh, once again, it doesn't seem reasonable to think that we can assume that whatever effect might exist would be quantitatively definite, would have a, a fixed quantitative magnitude. We may be safe in presupposing that there's a qualitative effect that at lower prices people buy more, <clears throat> but not that when the price goes down by 5%, the quantity purchase of gasoline would rise by 2% or some other uh, known quantitative amount. And third, we're also not very safe in presupposing that the effects are invariant over time, that we have a constancy of any quantitatively definite effects that might uh, exist. Um, quite to the contrary, we would again uh, think, we would presuppose <clears throat> that the effect of a change in price, the quantitative magnitude of the, of the effect of a change in price would vary from one action to the next, from one person to the next, from one place to the next, from one time to the next. The implication of this, of course, is that it's very unlikely that we can make scientific predictions about human action, that we can make quantitatively precise um, predictions in the same way that we do uh, make these predictions in the natural sciences. <clears throat> now, one may say that uh, this is all well and good, and we all agree that there aren't any uh, scientific laws of human action, but it might be purported that there are statistical laws, that we, we admit that there's some variation uh, from a perfect scientific prediction, but that it follows a statistical uh, relationship that permits us to make uh, statistical predictions. But let's think about the presuppositions necessary here. The first presupposition in making statistical prediction or in using statistical analysis or in presupposing that there's statistical laws of human action is that we have a class of events. So when we think about arenas where statistical laws uh, function and uh, predictions are based upon them, we usually think of gambling games, <clears throat> um, pulling uh, some particular card like the ace of spades out of a, out of a deck or a spinning a roulette a wheel and what the uh, possible what the probability of the possible outcomes are 
But in order to use statistical analysis, we have to have a class of events. We have to have a set of events about which we know nothing except that each iteration is in fact a member of the class. So all the spins of the roulette wheel are presumed to be uh, members of the class, but nothing else is known about any particular spin of the roulette wheel, except that it's a class of event. Now, this doesn't seem, again, likely uh, that we can presuppose this about human action. If we take the uh, case of, uh, let's say, uh, buying uh, a gasoline again, it, it seems to be the, that what we can safely presuppose is that we do in fact know something besides that some, one particular event is a member of a class. We know something else about the event. We know something in particular about the people or about the place or the time that separates it uh, from being a homogeneous uh, member of a class. <clears throat> Second, it's not clear that there would be any quantitatively definite probability density function for the uh, results of human action. This again at, uh, at best is something like a, uh, an artifact of the data that we construct after the fact. But we don't really think that, or it's not really safe to presuppose that in thinking about human action, let's say, the again, the quantity of gasoline that people buy at different prices, that there's some quantitatively definite uh, normal distribution that has a known uh, definite quantitative mean and standard deviation. At least we don't presuppose this very safely in the same way as we would with uh, the spin of a roulette wheel, where we do, in fact, know uh, after many, many iterations uh, what the probability density function looks like, what the different outcomes, the probability of the different outcomes happens to be. Uh, it's also not safe to uh, presuppose in the realm of human action that these um, relationships, the uh, data of the human action is invariant in its uh, distribution. Um, again, if we have a gambling game, well, we're pretty sure that there's an invariant probability density function. The uh, outcomes seem constricted by the nature of the game. But with human beings, we have creativity. We have the ability of uh, people to invent new possibilities of acting, uh, which leads us to suspect that uh, these presuppositions uh, do not hold <clears throat> in the realm of human action. The implication of this, of course, is it calls into question statistical prediction. We're not really safe in making predictions about human action on the basis of statistics. Let me give you one example. Let's suppose that uh, Steve Jobs, when he was uh, deciding whether or not to produce the uh, iPad based his decision on statistics. And so he formulated the class of events of tablet computers and he calculated the mean profitability of the different tablet computers on the market at the time and the standard deviation of that profitability. And then he predicted as any good statistician would, that the uh, profitability of the iPad would be the mean of the distribution. Again, you can see that this is highly uh, unlikely that any entrepreneur would base his decisions about uh, what to do in the market on the basis of statistics. And the reason being, as we said before, that Steve Jobs or any entrepreneur would know 
quite a bit about the individual event. You would know quite a bit more about the iPad than just it was one of a class of events. He would know about his own customers. He would know certain things about the uh, competition. He would uh, have foresight about what would happen uh, w once the uh, iPad was launched and so on and so forth permitting him to make a more accurate prediction than one just based on statistics. So if it isn't very advisable to apply the natural science method to uh, human action, if, if we're not uh, convinced that there are empirical hypothetical laws as there are in the natural sciences to be discovered in human action but instead that the uh, laws of economics are of a different character then it seems reasonable that the uh, method we employ would have to be different in order to discover them now we've named this method already we've called this praxeology we might say in uh, in uh, contrast to the um, empirical experiments in the natural sciences that this is a technique of mental experiments. The procedure looks like this. We begin by formulating reflective facts about human action. So all economic theory begins first just by introspection of what it means to engage in human action. What the relevant concepts are by which we understand human action. So some of these would be things like every action has an end. In every action the person employs means. The value of means is derivative from the value of the end that the person is trying to attain. Sometimes actions succeed and sometimes they fail. In every action, a person is trying to economize or to act in such a way that he or she acquires the greatest possible value. Now, once we've accumulated these reflective facts about human action, once we've unpacked the idea of action and uh, seen what concepts are relevant to action, by which we as human beings uh, make action meaningful. <clears throat> then the second step in the procedure is just deduction, just formal logic. We just begin by formulating premises from our reflective facts and then apply sound uh, valid logic and arrive at conclusions. Uh, we can then uh, construct chains of uh, logic where the conclusion of one argument becomes a premise of another argument and so on and so forth so we can work our way from very basic uh, conceptual beginning points about human action like the existence of an end or the character of valuing things or preferring one thing to another and through long chains of logic arrive at highly complicated analyses of complex social phenomena like the boom-bust cycle. Now the third uh, part of the uh, procedure of mental experiments are imaginary constructions. And imaginary constructions are just as the phrase uh, implies, um, constructs that we imagine in our minds as an aid to uh, the deduction process. And there are two of these that are very common in economics. One is the satirist paribus construct. This is where um, a situation of acting is posed and through the imaginary construct other factors that affect the outcome are held constant and one factor is changed. Uh, to illustrate, uh, again, consider the law of demand. The law of demand says only at lower prices will people buy more of a good. Satyrus paribus, other things the same. So the way would, uh, that economists formulate the law of demand would be as follows. 
uh, let's say that uh, tomorrow I go to the local gas station and I buy 10 gallons of gasoline at a price of $3.50. And the law of demand would say, if I could repeat this action exactly, if I could take this action again with exactly the same circumstances, the only difference being that the price of gasoline, instead of being $3.50, were $2.50, then what can we imply deductively, logically, about my action? And what we can imply about my action is that I would buy at least as much gasoline as I bought when the price was higher. That it would be logically impossible for me to buy uh, less gasoline if the price were lower, ceteris paribus. Uh, the second uh, imaginary construct that we use uh, quite often in economic uh, theory is called successive approximation. In successive approximation, what we do is we start with the simplest situation of acting we can imagine. This would be Robinson Crusoe stranded on his desert island, just one person alone with nature. From there, we can reason through uh, all of the basic uh, economic laws of action that then we'll see would apply in all of the more complicated situations of acting that a person might face. So this is a technique which permits us to uh, discover the foundational principles and then build upon them. And we build upon them by successively adding complicating factors until eventually we reach the full complexity of social life as we know it. So we have Caruso and then we introduce Friday. When we introduce Friday, uh, we can have exchange and the division of labor. And we can then work out the logic of these uh, types of actions. Uh, but with two people, we don't yet have money. To have money or a medium of exchange, we have to have uh, many people and a diversity of goods. And then it becomes uh, possible that some of the people trying to engage in trade would have the problem of barter and would then uh, engage in the entrepreneurial uh, innovation of indirect exchange. Once we have monetary exchange, we can have economic calculation. That is, we can have uh, specialized entrepreneurs who can do a monetary calculation. They can calculate their net income from production and their net worth from investment. And this then allows the uh, the full uh, developing of the market economy. And then from there, we can do comparative uh, economic analysis, comparing uh, the working of the market economy with the working of, say, a command economy, or the working of a market economy with an interventionist economy. Okay, in the next lecture, we'll talk about the scope of economics.